Welcome to the Collaborative Core Center for Clinical Research for the Clinical Research Speaker Series. We appreciate you taking the time to join us for this presentation. Today's presenter is Dr. Bethany Wolf, an Associate Professor in the Department of Public Health Sciences in the Division of Biostatistics at the Medical University of South Carolina. Her presentation today is titled Rigor, Reproducibility, and the NIH. Dr. Wolf, please start when you'd like. Okay, well, again, I want to thank everybody for attending, and I apologize for the technical difficulties at the ending. As I, at the beginning, as I said, it's kind of a funny beginning to a talk on rigor and reproducibility in the NIH. Um, I feel like my, we tried, we practiced this, or not practice, we tried logging me in and getting my presentation up and running the other day, and apparently that's not a reproducible result. So, funny thing to start the talk off with. Anyhow, um, I thank Sam for that um, wonderful introduction. And as she said, my talk is on rigor and reproducibility and with a particular focus on um, the NIH, because of course, for most of the folks that are on the line day at some point, um, right, you're likely to, or you've been involved in a grant. And we recognize that over the last 10 years, um, rigor and reproducibility really has become a major focus of the NIH and a requirement for all grant applications. Um, and so we wanna make sure that we're understanding what that means in the context of an NIH grant application and what that means in terms of our science in general. So I will say that this particular push by the NIH um, has been in response to concerns about scientific rigor um, in both the conducting and reporting of clinical and basic research and more generally specific, more in more general, but more specifically on research funded by the NIH. Um, and so in response to those concerns, the NIH has, has of course updated their requirements and expectations for describing um, how studies proposed in, in grants will meet these stringent criteria for rigor and reproducibility. So my goal today is really to provide an overview of the reasons for this requirement um, of the discussion of rigor in grant applications and then provide ideas of where the specific areas where PIs are supposed to define those expectations, define those um, aspects of rigor in their study and in the prior research. Um, and then within the grant requirements, how do we address those in a grant application moving forward? So to start off with, um, I wanna talk about a study that came out by Nidson et al. in 2019, um, focused on the idea of the fact that, that the NIH has introduced these um, increased requirements for reporting and describing rigor in grant applications and, um, and follow up when you're, once you've got the funding. So one of the things I would say is the NIH continues to evolve this requirement um, of rigor to demonstrate dedication to improving science um, and rigor in the projects that are funded by the NIH. And our academic institutions and other research institutions have worked very, very hard to make their faculty and researchers aware of these changes. Um, and the core facilities, such as are present in all the CCCRs that are on today, can be thought of as the boots on the ground for improving and enhancing the scientific rigor, rigor through their service, support, and education of researchers at the parent institutions. But and that was kind of the goal of this study by Knudsen at all. So they were examining the awareness of the NIH um, guidelines on scientific rigor conducted among researchers with access to core facilities. Um, and this was sort of an interesting finding. And one of the first things that they present in their paper is sort of this lack of awareness. So, I mean, you see, it's not a very large study. I mean, they had what, roughly 200 plus respondents. Um, but despite being relatively small, what you do notice is that though 114 of our respondents report being very aware of these requirements, you sort of have what, 128 that report not being aware, so a little over 50%. So more than a majority say they're either somewhat aware or completely unaware. Um, and so one of the goals of this talk is to provide an avenue for gaining understanding to these guidelines um, and the expectations of the NIH in the context of both the NIH and the broader scientific community with respect to rigor in um, scientific studies. So as I mentioned at the very beginning, there has been an increasing emphasis in the NIH on assurances that studies funded by the NIH adhere to these scientific principles of rigor. Um, and this is in clear keeping with their mission, as stated here, where we're seeking knowledge of the nature and behavior of living systems with the ultimate goal of improving health. Um, and so with that, the goal of promoting scientific integrity, accountability, and responsible conduct of all scientific pursuits 
the NIH has increased this expectation that grant proposals um, and PIs developing these proposals clearly describe how they're going to achieve robust and unbiased results in all aspects of their proposed research. So in keeping with the NIH, why did all of this happen? So somewhere around the mid 2000s, um, leading into around 2010, there were two large studies conducted by Amgen and Bayer to examine the reproducibility of several landmark papers um, in different disease settings. So Amgen was specifically focused on landmark, landmark articles in cancer, and Bayer sort of extended that to look at not only oncology trials, but women's health and cardiovascular disease as well. And the goal of both of these studies was to see if their teams of scientists could reproduce the findings of these landmark studies. So, right, we have these studies that are in top tier journals, very reputable, done by very reputable labs. Um, and yet in the Amgen study of the 53 studies that they examined, their team of scientists were essentially only able to produce six of 53, so slightly greater than 10%. Um, the second study, which was conducted by Bayer, again, examined more disease conditions and looked at 67 different articles. And it turns out they were a little bit better. They were able to reproduce 14 out of the 67 results. Um, and again, at about a rate of 20%, but still not great, right? And so this brought this issue of reproducibility to the scientific community's attention and really made us all kind of stand up and pay attention and say, okay, well, what, what's the issue here? So one of the things I would say is the lack of reproducibility that's observed in these studies um, is not necessarily due to false reporting of results, but, but has to do more with the conduct of um, conduct of the study, the lack of rigor um, in terms of reporting and transparency. And so again, the NIH wanted to be able to address some of this. So they went on and, and um, put out an RFA to look at some of this stuff. So this particular RFA was designed to um, conduct research ed, to develop research education programs to enhance training of scientists and the understanding of scientific rigor and how to apply these principles in their studies. Um, and what they did find as part of this study is I pointed out that the lack of reproducibility isn't in, isn't predominantly due to false reporting, not to say that there aren't instances of um, falsification of data, but that is not the predominant reason. It had more to do with the fact that there are just problems in um, amount of training that people have and things like that that hinder people's ability to do well. So some of the examples that were cited as part of the findings came out of the study by the NH was one of, you know, so we have issues of things like weak experimental design. So if I don't, don't design my study well up front, I don't necessarily um, generate results that are going to be reproducible. And so that was one of the major problems. They also found that there was often overinterpretation of marginal differences, um, which is an issue with rigor in your reporting. So being very careful about what you're saying you observed and how good the evidence is that you observed. Um, and then the third thing that they noticed was you have things like variability in materials, which is something that going back to this idea of rigor, we want to be careful about validating and verifying um, the materials that we're using. So imagine you have brands or lots of reagents that are varying between labs and that would cause issues. Or you can also think about things like strains of organisms um, and cells and culture. And again, those are going to vary from lab, potentially vary from lab to lab, and that can cause um, lack of reproducibility as well. And so from these findings, the NIH wanted to move forward and think about how do they change their requirements to try to enhance the likelihood of both rigorous and reproducible science coming out of funded projects through the NIH. And so kind of present here the timeline for changes that happen in the NIH. Um, that we're all subjected to. There's number. There's a couple of reasons to do this. Number one, to understand sort of what they were doing to address these issues of rigor that were identified. But number two, to understand this is a changing landscape. Um, and so the NIH is sort of constantly reevaluating and updating it. And we as researchers and scientists need to be aware. And so kind of putting it there, where are we at now? So for any of us that were doing research back in 2010, we certainly recall the shift of NIH to shorten our research grants, um, particularly the research strategies by 50%. So for example, our ones went from 24 pages to 12 pages, and our threes went from 12 to six pages. Um, and that sort of forced all of us to figure out how to be very concise in presenting our proposed studies. So the background, everything else had to be condensed down and be very concise. Um, so, in 2016, after those two landmark studies by Amgen and by Bayer, 
the NIH kind of got together and said, okay, well, we need to em enhance rigor and reproducibility in the grants that are coming, coming to us. And so they required PIs to start including evidence of rigor and reproducibility in their grant. Um, and so 2016, they changed the scientific premise section to be called the significance section, um, and they required rigor of the proposed research be described in the research approach. Um, they also introduced this idea of key biologic variables, which we'll talk about more, um, and those were supposed to be addressed in the approach. And finally, this idea, going back to the variability of batches between labs or cell lines between labs, things like that, they also wanted to demonstrate that um, PIs were aware that they needed to authenticate key, key biologic and chemical resources. And so the only nice thing about that last bullet point in 2016 is that was an additional attachment. So we didn't now have to fit all of this additional information into our 12 pages for R1 and our six pages for R3s, we had a little more room to help describe that authentication. So 2019 rolls around um, and we're all sort of, we've managed to shorten our grants between 2010 and 2016. We've added, learned to incorporate these things between 2016 and 2019. And in 2019, they changed scientific premise to the weakness of the prior rigor in the prior research. So now kind of shifting the focus in the, sort of the significant section from this, the idea of the scientific premise to addressing, demonstrating what the weaknesses were in the prior research in terms of rigor. Um, and so this required a discussion of how the weaknesses in the rigor of the prior research were going to be addressed in the current grant application that was being submitted. So that was the major change that happened in 2019. Now in 2020, the most recent change um, is not so much to these research grants that I've been talking about, but rather to the sort of the um, training type grants and career, award, career development award grants. So in 2020, and I think this was implemented May 25th of 2020, all grants moving forward had to have this if they were training grants or career development awards, they wanted to include within the training plans um, evidence of formal instruction in rigorous experimental design and transparency as part of all of these fellowships and a description of what additional skills and training would be Main, would be gained as part of the training grant in terms of um, rigorous research. And so that's the last formal change that's come out from the NIH um, with respect to rigor and reproducibility. So moving on from there, in order to really understand of how we address this concept of rigor and reproducibility in an NIH grant application, we first need to understand how the NIH defines scientific rigor. So, and this is a verbatim quote, their specific definition is the strict application of the scientific method to ensure robust and unbiased results. Now, that's a reasonably straightforward um, definition of rigor, but let's think a little bit more about what that means. So in order to further understand, we have to start by considering what we mean by robust and unbiased. So we can formally define bias, and by the way, there's lots of definitions for it, but we can formally define bias as any tendency which prevents unprejudiced consideration of a research question. So that can mean a lot of things. I mean, I'm coming from a statistical and epidemiological background, and so there's lots of things that I think when I think of bias, but certainly we can think about this as being things like failure to randomize in a controlled trial um, can introduce bias, right? So we end up with biased choice of subjects going into one arm or the other um, and things like that. Robust feeds off of the idea of unbiasedness. So robust results mean that the results that we obtain um, are using methods that avoid bias so that they can be reduced, reproduced under well-controlled and reported experimental conditions. And so I list here some of the factors um, that we could be considering when we're thinking about achieving scientific rigor, rigor and avoiding bias and yielding robust results. We wanna be thinking up front before we ever do the study about the experimental design, the methodology that we're gonna be using, how we might analyze the data, the type of interpretation that we anticipate being able to make and how we want to report our results. Um, and given all of this in NIH's definition, they have an expectation therefore that we're going to address these different aspects of rigor um, throughout our research strategy. So as we're putting the grant together, we need to be addressing all of these things and thinking about, are we clearly addressing their concept of rigor? So ensuring this idea that our results are gonna be robust, that they could be reproducible in another lab and that they're unbiased or as unbiased as possible. Okay, so 
with the goal of providing further guidance on how researchers should address rigor um, to ensure these unbiased and robust results in any grant application, the NIH has gone on and identified four key areas shown here. Um, so I, by the way, I'll also give you further examples of um, what, could, what could be used to reduce bias and what we mean by robust results. But the four key areas that the NIH has identified that need to be addressed in our grant application are shown here. So the first is the prior, prior rigor of the prior research, um, which requires careful assessment of the strengths and weaknesses of the key supporting evidence describing um, that we describe to motivate our project. So I mean, I honestly feel like before this requirement ever came out, people were doing this anyway. It's just sort of framing it in the context of rigor and reproducibility. So again, I mean, anytime you're describing your significance, you want to say what the prior science has shown and where the gaps are. So in that way, you are addressing the prior, the rigor of the prior research. Um, however, it can pull in some of these additional concepts that we're about to talk about. So it can deal with things like biologic variables, experimental design, all these other aspects. Um, and we'll look at real life examples of where some of that comes into play. The second key area that they considered was scientific rigor of your proposed research. So not only do you have to say how rigorous the last, the research preceding you was and where the gaps were, but you're addressing those gaps, how are you going to address them and how is your research going to be rigorous moving forward? Um, and so, as I have just been describing, this means that we're talking about describing um, the, the, the fact that the description of the proposed experiments needs to include a discussion of how bias is going to be mitigated or avoided. Um, we should emphasize things like experimental design and methods proposed to conduct the research and describe how those are going to achieve robust and unbiased results. The third key area, um, which I'm pretty sure at this point everybody's heard about sex as a biologic variable. Um, so the third key area that they identified was biologic variables. And again, as I said, I feel like everybody's heard about sex as a bi biologic variable. And this is sort of the predominant bi biological variable that should be addressed in all grant applications. So at some point, a mention needs to be made of sex as a biologic variable in a grant. Um, but in theory, this, this idea of biologic variables as being a key aspect of rigor that we need to address could refer to things above and beyond sex. And so essentially, we want to think about any biologic factor that we expect to be critical to the disease or condition under study. So we can imagine um, in human studies, things like age and comorbidities might actually impact whatever their outcome is that we're interested in looking at. And so we would want to address those things. Um, and those are often motivated by scientific knowledge about the disease condition. So we may be studying the genetics of something, but we know that comorbidities impact that disease outcome. And so we want to account for those while also looking at the genetic aspects of the disease. Okay, so the final area that they identified was this key area uh, was authentication of key biologic or chemical resources. Um, and again, this fortunately is added as a separate attachment, but can be highlighted in the grant in various places um, in terms of describing how you're going to authenticate though you have this attachment to do that. And in the attachment, you want to provide sufficient description of the methods that ensure the validity of your key biologic or chemical resources that you're proposing to use in the study. Um, so all four, as I mentioned, all four of these aspects are expected to be included in any grant application. And so we're going to discuss in a little bit how exactly do we address these at what, what part of the grant did they go in and how do we address them when we're putting them in the grant. But we also want to think about what a reviewer is thinking about. So part of the reason that you want to make sure that you include this in the grant is the NIH has also put out as a mission to their reviewers that they take this into consideration. So reviewers are now being asked to make sure that they're assessing the rigor and reproducibility of the research and that those aspects um, of the study are sufficiently discussed in, um, in sufficient detail that the reviewers feel that the science is going to be rigorous. So in keeping with those requirements for the applicant, um, as I said, reviewers have been asked to also consider these four key aspects. So that means that reviewers are anticipating seeing information within the application and predominantly within the research strategy that address those four key areas that we've just mentioned. Um, so in the significance section, the reviewers are going to expect to see a discussion of the strengths and weaknesses of the prior supporting research um, in terms of the rigor and what that what the specific study um, is going to, how it's going to fill the gaps in rigor that were identified in the, in the significance 
once we're in the approach section, those gaps in rigor and the prior research can again be mentioned, but the focus is now going to shift to number one, how does the proposed study address the gaps that we've identified? And number two, how is the proposed study itself going to meet the guidelines of rigor? Um, and we can do that through careful discussion of the analytical methods, the statistical approach, sample size justification, um, et cetera. So, reviewers are also still looking for that idea of the key biologic variables. And again, pretty much all reviewers are now aware that they need to be paying attention to sex as a biologic variable and, and seeing that there's some mention of how it's going to be handled in the grant. But there's also other relevant biologic variables, as I mentioned before, if we're talking about sort of natural aging disease processes, so patient age, uh, participant age, other comorbidities, may want to you may want to consider those as well. Um, and so being aware of the science and what variables somebody would want you to consider and account for when you're trying to test a specific hypothesis. Um, so those can be included in your research strategy as well. And again, could be addressed in the, in the rigor of the prior research if somebody's failed to address those issues in the prior research. And finally, that key authentication of biologic and chemical resources um, is fortunately an attachment. So you can describe all that in an attachment um, you can allude to it in the grant itself, but you don't have to go into detail about how you're going to authenticate variables um, in your actual research strategy. So you do have that additional um, place that you can put that information. So I do want to look at these in, in a little more detail, each of these four aspects in a little more detail in the context of a real world or a several real world examples. Um, so we're going to start with that first point that they made, and that's that rigor of the prior research. Um, so as we noted in 2019, the NIH updated their guidance on the significant section of the grant to indicate that the grants need to frame their supporting evidence of their project in the context of rigor. So again, rigor of the prior research. So they note that the applicant should discuss um, sort of the strengths and weaknesses of the prior research and how they're going to address those gaps. So they also note this, that where applicable and possible, the applicant should also address, describe specific reasons why prior research failed to meet those um, rigor criterion. So for example, due to experimental design or issues with key biologic variables or poor authentication of um, key biologic resources or chemical, chemicals or resources. So again, still pulling in those other aspects in evaluating the rigor of the prior research. So it's not just that we're describing the rigor in terms of the science didn't show this and the science did show that. You're also potentially addressing some of these other things that they consider to be aspects of rigor. So this is a shortened version of a paragraph from a significant section um, of a grant application. And in this grant, the investigator was interested in evaluating uh, leukocyte telomere length at birth on health and disease throughout life course um, in a human population. And so in this paragraph, the investigators essentially have the goal of clearly stating any strengths and weaknesses of the prior research um, that's key to supporting the argument of why they need to do what they're going to do, but then also how they're going to fill that gap. Um, I know that it's a lot to read, so we're going to highlight specific areas so that it's a little bit easier to see these aspects of rigor and reproducibility. So first thing I want to highlight, they start off um, the paragraph with an inherent weakness in the rigor of the prior research. So they note that telomere length, that recent prior research on telomere length is focused predominantly on adults. Um, and in particular here, they're saying middle-aged and elderly adults. Um, and recall that they were interested in the impact of telomere length um, at birth on lifespan outcomes. And so if I'm interested in the impact from birth onward, and I'm all of my studies up to that point have been focused on middle and older, middle-aged and older folks, then clearly I'm missing that aspect. Um, so that's the weakness that they identify. They then go on to point out a strength of the prior research um, in that the studies that have been presented show good evidence, despite being in an adult populations, that shorter telomere length is associated with poorer health outcomes. And in particular, they focus on cardiovascular disease and atherosclerosis. Um, and reduce longevity. Okay, so they're saying, yes, the studies have only looked at older and middle-aged adults, but they have shown that there's evidence that this is associated with cardiovascular disease, atherosclerosis, and reduced longevity. And so then you want to go on to say, okay, well, how are they going to fill that gap? So the gap that they need to fill that they identify is they note 
that um, the leukocyte telomere length at birth is a determinant of the length throughout human lifespan. So it, if I'm only looking at older adults, I'm sort of missing this aspect of what happened at birth for this particular individual. And so given that studies of adults have shown that length impacts human health outcomes and length at birth impacts length in adulthood, they're arguing that determinants of telomere length at birth can then provide information about health throughout lifespan. So this example focuses on the aspects of describing the strengths and weaknesses of the prior research with respect to rigor. But as we noted, there are additional aspects of rigor, um, for example, weaknesses in study design and biological, key biologic variables that may also be important to discuss. Now, this example doesn't necessarily highlight that, but we do kind of want to look at some examples where that happens to be true. So, hold on. To give a little more context of some other things that you might consider. Um, so again, we could look at things like weaknesses of experimental design. Now, I will say, I feel like unless there's the consistent flaw in experimental design, across studies, this is not one that's necessarily highlighted all that often, but should you see this gap and you have the ability to fill it, it's a good one to point out. Um, so in this case, we have an investigator who's looking at smoking behavior throughout adulthood and just to highlight what weakness they're specifically pointing to. Um, they're interested in looking at genetic factors implicated in smoking cessation. And in this case, they're pointing out that much of the literature um, regarding these associations has been in the, has been captured only in data looking either at a single time point, so a cross-sectional study or based on very short-term follow-up. Um, and they're arguing that sort of you have this phenotype where a person goes back and forth between smoking current and former smoker throughout lifetime. And so this study design, which is relatively common, fails to capture that phenotype. Now, the other thing I would point out is if you point out a gap like this, then you better be able to address it. So clearly the investigator is laying the groundwork to say, this is the gap that I want to address. Okay, so in that same study, um, we can also think about this in terms of key biologic variables. And in particular, our favorite key biologic variable, sex is a biologic variable. So they go on to point out um, that one of the difficulties with the prior rigor of the prior research is examining sex as a biological variable biologic variable, they note that a lot of the studies looking at smoking cessation in women have focused on smoking during pregnancy, which is a very specific aspect of, um, and a very specific population of women. And so this is a reasonable lapse in rigor to describe, but of course, then you want to make sure that it's something that you're addressing in the proposed study. So finally, we could also consider um, poor authentication of key biologic variables or chemical resources. This one's a little bit harder to find an example on, so I kind of feel like this is, my example here is not great, but it, it works to some degree. Um, so this particular grant, the investigator was examining temporal stages of tubule formation after episodes of acute kidney injury. So tubule formation in the kidneys after we've had acute kidney injury. And what they note is that um, sort of the in vitro model systems of tubulogenesis that had been available up to this point lacks sensitivity to evaluate the temporal changes um, and stages of tubule formation. And that implies that the prior research, any prior research trying to understand how tubule formation progresses after acute kidney injury would suffer from insufficient sensitivity to be able to describe those stages of tubulogenesis as the tubules are growing. Uh, this is the statistician speaking, not basic scientist. Anyway, so to solve that, they do propose to develop a model with sufficient sensitivity to examine this, which, so they're saying they're going to address this gap that they've identified. But of course, this means that in the approach, they're going to need to, to include a description of how they're going to evaluate and authenticate this new system that they're proposing. Um, so keep in mind, if you address a gap like this, you need to say how you're going to address it. And, and you're also then going to be a, an authenticated key biologic or chemical variable. Okay, so once we've addressed the of the research that we're proposing in the grant proposal. So this is the second key aspect that the NIH highlights. Um, and although we've just seen that we can highlight these aspects of rigor and reproducibility when we're examining the rigor of the prior research, 
there's certainly an expectation that in the approach section of our grant, we're going to describe how the experiments that we undertake will demonstrate a clear and careful application of the scientific method to ensure those robust finding, robust and unbiased findings. So again, we've already noted that in this includes describing the experimental design methodology, um, our statistical analysis, how we're going to interpret the results um, and report it. But we want to think in a little bit more detail about what considerations we need to make when developing our grant. So again, um, despite academic training in the scientific method, and I think all of us, even in, I mean, high school and, and college and beyond are trained to some degree in the scientific method, there's still often a failure to conduct our science in a rigorous manner. And so in that same study by Knudsen et al that I described at the very beginning, where we said, oh, a little over half of the people in that study said they really were aware, only vaguely aware or unaware of the guidelines for rigor. Um, they also asked them about sort of factors that they felt contributed to um, difficulty with complying to rigor and reproducibility guidelines. And so if we look at this table here, the top reasons that are listed um, include lack of training, mentorship, or technical expertise in oversight, which is followed by time pressure, which you can't do a whole lot about, and inadequate standardization of protocols. Um, they also mentioned that poor study design, cost inappropriate tools in the lab, and poor documentation can also um, sort of lead to some of this lack of compliance with rigor and reproducibility. There are a few other cat categories um, that are described here. I include irresponsible conduct of research within, in my mind, within the inadequate training to some degree, since essentially if I have adequate training in, in, my, in mentorship and rigor and reproducibility, then, then I shouldn't be falling on, I shouldn't be irresponsibly conducting my research. Um, and then the other one that they give is um, inadequate peer review, which presuming that you're meaning inadequate, inadequate peer review of manuscripts submitted to a journal describing the science that was conducted, that's, you mean the fault sort of falls on the reviewers then, which goes back to the time constraint that all of us are facing. Um, but given these themes, we wanna think about what steps we can take when designing our studies. And this is what the NIH is wanting, is that it, how can we think about these key aspects when we're designing our studies to try to minimize our risk of lack of rigor in our science. Um, okay, so one of the things that we want to think is there's an important element to ensure um, study rigor is careful consideration of things like data collection and analysis prior to the beginning of the study. So that can help mitigate some of what we just saw in the last table. Um, so this means that in a grant application, we need a clear description of these aspects um, within our grant. and. If we've thought about them carefully up front, in theory, that should greatly enhance the chance that the science, once we're able to conduct it, is going to be done in a rigorous manner. Um, if we're doing any sort of uh, randomized controlled trial, whether it be in animals or people, um, we can think about things like blinding or randomization to help avoid possible bias as well. Um, it helps us sort of avoid storytelling and rationalizing after the fact. Um, so now from a this is the stats part, yay. <laughs> in order to design your rigorous experiment up front, we want to take care in describing all aspects of the study. Um, and so I'm listing a whole bunch here, but it in certainly includes things like describing an appropriate, uh, describing appro appropriate experimental controls, um, how we're going to address bias. So I've already mentioned some of these. This includes things like blinding, randomization, careful consideration of subject inclusion, exclusion criteria, and I'm sure that you can think of others. Um, once we've sort of done that, we can then think about clearly laying out our power analysis and sample size justification, um, which should indicate that the study is going to be successful in identifying what's known as a relevant difference, right? So we want to essentially set up our sample size and power, power analysis and sample size justification to say, here's the difference that we want to detect, and we need this many animals, people, replicates, whatever, to be able to achieve that. Um, and then we also need to describe the statistical methods. So that will all, all of this goes into helping us make sure that we're conducting our experiment in a rigorous way and, and setting it up with a rigorous design. So in thinking about how to plan that actual experiment, um, there are several key aspects that we need to consider. So they include things like the study design, which we've alluded to, data management and collection, which we've also alluded, we've alluded to all of these, the analysis plan. And we do want to make sure that we 
carefully think through what we anticipate our results to be. Um, and anybody that submitted a grant application knows that we submit a section called anticipated results and limitations and describe all of that. So it's not anything that we're not used to, but again, it contributes to this idea of rigor. So of course, if we're thinking about these different aspects, there are different components that go into deciding what we need to do to address them from a rigorous standpoint. Um, so from the study design standpoint, um, the first, before we can ever really think about designing our study, the first thing that we have to do is clearly define our hypothesis. Um, so when I say that, what I mean that you, it, this requires a clear definition of a measurable outcome, um, what sorts of comparisons are gonna be made. We also then wanna think about um, additional information like replicates, time points, et cetera. And so once that hypothesis is clearly defined, then a study design can be selected that if, that's useful for evaluating that hypothesis. Um, that information can then be fed into determining the necessary sample size to achieve some target power to test that hypothesis that we posed at the beginning. So once we have our study design set up, we also should get careful consideration. And I will say, I feel like this is an aspect that we fail to do enough, but should get careful consideration to how the data is gonna be collected and managed. Um, specifically thinking about what data is gonna be collected, how the data is gonna be stored, any evaluation of the quality of the data entry. So you can think about if we're doing clinical studies, we'll often do duplicate entry and verify that in fact, it's being entered appropriately. Um, de-identification, all that good stuff needs to go in there. Um, the grant application itself needs to include an analysis plan. So we talked about designing the study. Well, so the study design sort of dictates the statistical analysis that needs to be done. And so we want the choice of statistical method that we describe in that analysis plan to be appropriate to our outcome and the hypothesis that we wanna test. Um, and we wanna give some details about the implementation. So again, going back to this idea about sex as a biologic variable or any other biologic variables, you'd like to include those details at this point describing in implementing your statistical method, how are you addressing sex as a biologic variable or any other biologic variable that you might be interested in. And then finally, as I mentioned, um, there should be a discussion of the anticipated results and any limitations. So I mentioned in this bullet point, I've got um, the statistical method section. And so even though there's a section on anticipated results and limitations that comes after you've kind of described how you're gonna do the experiment, in the statistical methods section, you can talk about how you're going to get that measure. So what exactly are you going to get out of your statistical model to be able to compare that's gonna give you this anticipated result? And so they kind of tie together um, to give you a full picture, give the reviewer a full picture. So again, with the limitations, you should address them, but this is still getting at that idea of rigor because you're identifying any potential gaps in rigor and what you might be proposing and how you're gonna handle those potential gaps. So still wanting to make sure that you're demonstrating sufficient rigor in your experimental design and what you're gonna do. Okay, so once we've gone through all that, we can start thinking about how do we go about choosing our appropriate experimental design. So as I just noted on the previous slide, um, our first step of course is defining, clearly defining our hypothesis. I will say it's helpful if you're collaborating with a statistician to state it as a statistical hypothesis um, rather than as a clinical hypothesis. So for example, we wanna test the hypothesis that mean level in group A differs from mean level in group B as a very statistical hypothesis. So I'm describing my outcome as a mean, which means my outcome variable is continuous and I'm comparing group A to group B. So in part, defining that hypothesis can help ensure that you've determined your outcome type. So whether it's categorical or continuous, um, and it does mean that you should have a clear definition of what your outcome is. It should be something that's measurable and that reviewers and scientists can clearly understand. So you can't just throw it, and we'll see this, I do example in a second, but you can't just you know say, well, we're gonna measure blood pressure. Well, how are you gonna measure blood pressure? What are the specific things that you're gonna measure to describe blood pressure? Granted, that's a pretty bad example, but cholesterol or uh, lipidemic, lipidemic, lipidemia, hyperlipidemia. How are you gonna define hyperlipidemia? Things like that. Um, we do need to, again, consider additional aspects such as variables of interest. So I've already talked before about comparing group A to group B in my example of a statistical hypothesis. So we know in that case, there's probably a treatment variable. But of course, we can include things like sex as a biologic variable or other relevant biologic variables that we want to consider. Um, and then finally, we need to give considerations to things like the location of design points. And by this, I mean 
things like timing of measurements, um, exposure doses that you're going to use, etc. So other things that go into designing your study and giving sufficient detail that a reviewer can understand what you're proposing to do to evaluate whether or not the approach that you're taking is appropriate. You should also be aware if you are seeking statistical consultation or help on a grant, um, which I'm going to argue is a really good idea. There are often more complex aspects to study uh, a study design that both you and the statistician need to be aware of in order to appropriately design the study. Um, also throwing this out there because in the event that you're collaborating with a statistician, every study is different. They all, statisticians take careful consideration of each study and you need to give them sufficient time to be able to appropriately design the analysis plan and tailor it to your specific study. So it's not that I can do a t-test or an ANOVA for everything that ever comes my way. I want to make sure that I'm I'm putting it in the context of the question that's being asked and the hypothesis that the investigator wants to answer. So I need sufficient time to understand the science. However, as I said, there's also potentially more complex um, aspects to your study design. So for example, a lot of experiments will include multiple measurements per subject. Um, and from a statistics standpoint, this needs to be taken into consideration. Um, we can also think about studies that have slightly more complex outcomes, such as time to event. So if I'm doing a, a time to event trial in cancer, I need to know that that outcome has some special considerations that I have to think about, such as how many people are likely to have the event, um, when they're likely to have the event, enrollment rates, et cetera. Um, and then the second and third bullet points here. So we do need to carefully consider the idea of multiple testing. Um, this comes into play, I feel like it, it does come into play in human studies, but it's very important in animal and cell line studies, especially when we start getting into omics data for any of you that do omics research or high throughput data research, um, you have lots of outcomes that you're evaluating. And so we want to do some sort of adjustment for multiple testing to ensure that we're being rigorous in what we, going back to our not over-interpreting our results, making sure that we're rigorous in ascertaining what is associated um, and what differs for the hypothesis that we want to test. Um, and then finally, that last bullet point, um, pretty much any statistical analysis plan at this point um, should mention at least on some level, sex is a biologic variable. But again, any other biologic variables that are relevant to the disease or condition being studied should also be considered in the study design. And so you sort of have to assume that you're going to have a reviewer that has some content knowledge and may specifically be interested and ask about variables that they know are, are associated um, and want to address those. Okay, so once we've set our hypothesis and we've selected our study design, we do want a power analysis um, to be conducted and described in the grant and it should demonstrate the necessary sample size to appropriately test the proposed hypothesis. So, in thinking about how we come up with that um, power calculation and sample size, there are a couple of aspects that we need to be aware of going into calculating that sample size. So the first is the level of significance um, for which the null hypothesis would be rejected. Of course, that's usually set at alpha equal 0.05, but it, going back to that multiple testing issue, you may want to do some correction for multiple testing. Um, we also want to think about the desired target power. So usually this is set at 80 or 90%, but you can make it higher or lower depending on what you're doing. I wouldn't ever go much below 80 and higher than 90, perhaps, but you get potentially into really large sample sizes. Um, we also want to consider the minimum scientifically important difference. And of these five things, I feel like that's one of the most important aspects as the investigator on the grant to come up with. So this is a scientific supposition, not a statistical choice. And what you want to think about is you're coming up with what you think the minimum scientifically important difference is, is what would make the scientific community stand up and take notice is the way I usually describe it to people. So when would it make people think about changing their practice, changing their thought about something, believing the hypothesis to be non-null, et cetera. Um, so they also, we also need to know something about the variability in the anticipated response, which is a little bit tougher. So this can be gleaned from the literature, from preliminary research, um, et cetera. But it does, you do need to have that to some degree to be able to calculate a sample size and um, do a power calculation. And finally, of course, we need the experimental design, which we discussed on the prior slide. So that helps determine what, how we're doing the sample size calculation. Okay, so. As I mentioned before, and this is, so this is point number three. I've kind of skipped over an example of point number two. So point number two is going over rigor of your current, of the research that you're proposing. Um, but 
that third point that the NIH makes about needing to address rigor in terms of relevant biologic variables is important in terms of the experimental design as well. So I kind of wanted to bring that in before we walk through an example of scientific rigor in the actual proposed study. So as I mentioned um, before, we do need to think about it when we're designing the study. And the NIH describes any relevant biologic variable as a variable, that, again, that's expected to impact disease condition, the disease or condition under study. And we've noted those certainly include sex, but things like age, comorbidities, genetic strain um, that we're considering. And those vary depending on the disease and condition being studied. And again, as I pointed out, it's a matter of scientific knowledge and understanding. So for example, body mass index is known to be associated with risk of diabetes. So if we want to examine the genetic factors that impact diabetes, we probably want to account for BMI of our patients when we're looking at those genetic factors because sort of want to make sure that there's not some confounding going on that we're missing. I did want to go a little more over sex as biology variables. So NIH points out as, as a general point three that relevant biologic variables, but they make a specific point of discussing sex as a biologic variable. So among the biologic variables, sex has been given special emphasis by the NIH, um, and they argue that it's been frequently ignored, particularly in animal studies. And as a result, this has led to an incomplete understanding of potential sex-based di sex differences in disease processes and treatment response. And so they're trying to mitigate that, that sort of bias that's been introduced in animal studies, though it's going to be true in human studies as well, potentially. And so there's pretty much an expectation that sex is biologic variable is going to be considered in almost all studies. Um, so I give examples here. So if little is known about the sex differences, then it's almost imperative that sex is considered in the study design. Now. That does not mean that the study has to be powered to detect differences in sex, but rather that you have sufficient numbers within each sex to at least be able to examine differences and identify where potential differences exist. So, and, and they talk about in, in the NIH, they give the idea that you should report sex results by sex difference, so report results by sex, that's what I'm trying to say, Friday afternoon. Um, so they're clearly wanting to, you to address this. now. If differences are known to exist, uh, then you really do need to provide strong justification, or not known to exist, then you need to provide, still need to provide strong justification why, why you're proposing only one sex. And finally, if differences are known to exist, then the study really should be designed um, and powered to address those differences. So just a few key points here, examples where sex is a biologic variable isn't necessary include things like studies where um, disease is sex specific, so prostate or ovarian cancer. So women don't have a prostate and therefore can't have prostate cancer and ovarian cancer is the flip side of that. Um, I have seen it um, where we've managed to successfully sell looking at a single sex in studies of lupus, which is a predominantly um, a disease that predominantly occurs in women over men. But again, it's it's a hard sell and you do get critiqued for it if you try to do it. And so if you're going to do it, you had better have really good justification. The other thing I would point out here is at the moment, there's not a requirement for, for sex as a biologic variable in cell line studies, um, but the NIH is working on figuring out if there's not a way that that can be done. What they point out is that it's, it's still fairly different to authenticate in cell line sex as a biologic variable. And so that's the question that comes into play. Um, but there is some work at the NIH that's going on trying to look at whether or not that can be incorporated somehow. So at the moment, if you're doing cell lines, you can get away with it. But look for things from the NIH to change in you know a year or two. OK, so let's look at this in terms of a specific example. Um, and again, there's a lot to read here. And in this case, I'm giving you an example of something that has um, it's not necessarily the study itself would have poor rigor, but the way that it's written, it'd be hard to assess whether or not the rigor was appropriate. So this is a study looking at, they wanted to look at um, DOS, and I can't, DOS is a stool softener, um, exposure to DOS on adiposity. So there's some evidence that DOS is, can increase adiposity in humans. And in this particular case, they're looking at a mouse model and they wanna look at exposure in offspring of treated pregnant mice. Um, so they give some details here um, about Adiposity is going to be evaluated at 12 weeks post-birth. Um, they're going to be eating a regular child diet. We're going to use a linear mixed model. Model assumptions are going to be checked. And they say there's going to be six pups per dam, six dams per group. So we're going to have 36 pups per group. And we're going to compare. And that gives us 80% power. So this, this particular analysis plan is lacking a lot of detail. So what could we do to improve rigor? So 
think about all of those things that we've discussed to improve, improve, improve rigor, here's a sort of beefed up analysis plan that's been considered to address some of those aspects of rigor. And again, kind of like the example of rigor of the prior research, this is a lot to read. So we're gonna highlight some key aspects. So the first thing that they've done is they've gone into clearly define their outcome variables. So the outcome variable is adiposity, but adiposity is a very vague outcome. Um, and so they've gone on to further define this as adiposity, which is measured by acosinoid lipid accumulation. So they now have a way to measure adiposity in these pups from born to these dams that were treated with DOS. Um, they also describe the location of design points. So dams are gonna be randomized to one of three different DOS levels. So none, high, low and high. Now in theory, none, low and high is still pretty vague somewhere in the rest of the analysis plan. Hopefully those are defined as to what that specifically means. They also point out that my, the dams are gonna be exposed either at mid gestation to birth or between birth and weaning. So the pups themselves are getting the exposure e either in utero or when they're nursing. And then they're gonna evaluate pup adiposity at four, eight and 12 weeks of age. So lots of design points here, way more detail than the prior analysis plan. Okay, they go on to describe a statistical, the appropriate statistical approach. So again, we're comparing adiposity between groups and we're using a linear mix model. The model itself is gonna include a nested random effect for pup within dam to account for repeated measures of adiposity over time and on pups for correlation for pups within dams. So looking at correlation for pups born to the same dam and then the fact that we're measuring the pups over time. Finally, they go on to describe independent variables that they're gonna consider. So DOS exposure, the period of exposure, the pup age and the interaction between those effects. Um, and they point out that they're gonna consider sex as a biologic variable. So they note that they're going to include pup as a se pup sex as a biologic variable to account for potential sex differences. And then in the, in the actual power calculation, they do, it's grayed out, but they do an initial power calculation. The second one is based on that smaller sample size comparing within sexes, within and between sexes. So going from our 36 mice per group to our 18 per group and what power does that provide to detect differences? And finally, they address multiple testing. So again, you imagine now we had three different exposure levels of DOS. We had two different timings of when the dams were exposed to DOS and three different time points at which the, which the pups were measured. So they do a Bonfroni correction to the, and I can go back one, noting that the, um, Oh, it doesn't, so, so the significance level shown here is alpha 0.002. So they've accounted for this multiple pairwise comparisons that they're gonna make to ensure, again, sufficient statistical rigor and that the conclusions that they draw are rigorous. Now, that, that addresses all of the aspects of rigor I've, that you can predominantly talk about in analysis one, but there are other aspects of, um, that can be used to enhance reproducibility in a lab. And these can be addressed in a grant application. So if you have specific expertise or things that you wanna highlight in a grant, some of the additional um, things you can do to show rigor and reproducibility of your group and their ability to do rigorous and reproducible research in your lab is to talk about the equipment that's gonna be used, um, how, again, how data are gonna be managed, stored and collected, Note that you have standard operating procedures and protocols and how those deviations from the protocols will be reported, how you're gonna train lab staff and any how experiments are gonna be documented. Um, and that same study by Nitsen et al, they report some of these other things as well. So they talk about tools that people have reported using to enhance their reproducibility. And they include things like quality control procedures. Um, again, having a standard operating procedure for your lab, data management and archiving education and training, technical support, so on and so forth. So lots of things that one can do. And again, you can highlight specific aspects of these in, grant, in the grant as well to kind of demonstrate that your lab does rigorous and reproducible research. That final aspect um, mentioned by the NIH is the authentication of key resources. So as we've mentioned, a key biologic resource um, is any chemical or, or biologic variable that we can, or not bi biologic, resource that we're going to use, so cell lines, et cetera, um, that may differ between labs over time. So quantities and qualities that could influence our results. And so I give some examples there. So the grant attachment should allow for a description of these things that we're, what we're going to use to authenticate our key, our key resources. Um, and so addressing if we're using animal models or cell lines, or specialty chemicals or biologics, we're able to describe how those are authenticated and why they're gonna be rigorous and reproducible so that somebody could go back and basically use the same reagent or the same cell line or the same biologic 
um, to be able to reproduce our results. This is a not a great example. So animal models are kind of somewhere between a biologic variable and a um, key resource. But we're going to use this as an example to help you think about what this might mean. So for example, animal models of human disease are very useful and can be used to define um, disease mechanisms and test new therapeutics. And so of course, I work specifically um, in the area of lupus and scleroderma research. And so there are lots and lots of animal models for lupus. And in fact, the gentleman that wrote this paper is online with us. So if he wanted to speak more about it, he could. Um, but he points, that paper points out, there's spontaneous models, transgenic induced models, knockout models, and humanized models. Um, and in humans, the disease itself is heterogeneous. And so any one of these models does not completely represent the heterogeneity of lupus as a human disease. So this means that if I demonstrate the efficacy in one animal model, it's similar to proving the efficacy in a limited subset of lupus patients. Um, and so we have to take care in selecting the most appropriate animal model or perhaps consider more than one to show that some treatment aspect works in more than one aspect of the disease. And finally, there's a good deal on um, transparency. So once we manage to, to be funded, we want to make sure that we're seeking fully transparent, transparent results. Um, so this means describing our experiments in sufficient details um, so that people can reproduce our results. And this can include things like describing our data analysis. Um, clearly, we've gotten into the world where we are pretty good about sharing um, data and programs. We want to make sure that we're doing things like data archiving. That does actually need to be described in the grant. So again, moving our data from storage to long-term retention or submitting to some data repository. And there's a bunch of those available. That being said, there's some additional key aspects I would point out. So increasingly, studies um, involve obtaining data from multiple sources that are processed through analytical pipelines. And that itself can be difficult to recreate. Um, because we have things like, how did you identify the data sources? What rated relevant data elements did you consider from those data sources? How did you link data from different sources? And how did the curation of the final data set happen? So it's not enough just to archive that final data set that's generated from multiple data sources. You actually have to describe this process. And it turns out, we want to make sure that we're describing the details of how the data were curated. Um, the thing that I really want to point out here is there are platforms that exist for providing this detail that are beneficial to our careers. So there's now peer-reviewed data descriptors and protocols that are available. So for example, Nature Protocol and Scientific Data, which is a journal through the Nature Publishing Group, both provide a platform for us to sort of produce this kind of information as a peer-reviewed paper in and of itself that's going to describe things about how a data set was from multiple sources was curated, collected, and finalized so that somebody could then go back and repeat that um, data pool and analysis. And it also, those kinds of papers are going to include things like the data descriptor, so the metadata describing the data, digital object identifiers, um, and any, co any code that would be necessary to be able to replicate the analysis that got the final data set and the analysis of the data set. Now, there are whole courses on rigor and reproducibility. This is a 58 minute talk at this point. Um, the NIH does in fact have numerous resources to help investigators understand how to include rigor in their grant applications. And these include documents, there's video training, there are two really nice cheat sheets um, that you can use. And so if you just Google NIH um, rigor and reproducibility, you can get all kinds of um, links to things that are helpful. I list four of them here, but there's a whole bunch more. Um, that have come out. There's also blogs and web posts regarding rigor and reproducibility that are out there and available. So, you know, you've got all these resources at your fingertips, seeking training um, as often as you can get it, and having collaborators through things like the CCCR shared resources that are able to provide guidance on how to incorporate rigor and reproducibility in your grant are extremely helpful as well. On that note, um, just had a four four groups that helped me um, with my think about my presentation and how I was going to present rigor and reproducibility. And I'm happy to take any questions at this time. So thank you all for listening to such an exciting talk on a Friday <laughs> and waiting for me to get here since my computer didn't want to talk. Beth, is there any evidence that this has improved? reproducibility and rigor 
I mean, I that I've seen that now that you mentioned it, no, although there are a lot of papers. So what I have seen, so like the, the Knudsen et al. paper um, showed evidence. I mean, I feel like 47% being aware of the guidelines was up and there's clear awareness of tools and the necessity of rigor and reproducibility. Now, whether or not the implementation in NIH grants has resulted in more rigorous and reproducible research, I don't know that that's been fully vetted or evaluated yet. So. I'm sure the NIH is working on it. And if you wrote a grant, I'm guessing they give you money to look at that. <laughs> That's a great question. It is a great question. And it's, I hadn't really thought about looking at that because you think about it, they really implemented this around 2016. So we now have roughly five years of expectations on the part of the NIH that scientists are going to try to more thoroughly address rigor in their science. Um, there's lots of studies on improving education and tools to do that. But the one I was interested in, so just going back to the idea of the multiple data sources. So this is a huge issue with rigor and reproducibility, the fact that now people are starting to pull it. So if we think about doing things like metagenomics or um, like I have a student that's looking at combining annotation data with GWAS summary statistics, and it's like, okay, but that gets potentially complicated because now you're pulling data from these disparate sources. and once you've done that analysis, describing to somebody how to reproduce those results is not something that's been all that well documented and sort of, so there is an effort on the part of things like these journals, Nature Protocol and scientific data to at least enhance the ability to, to number one, to be reproducible in those kinds of settings and to also um, provide protocols to ensure that that there's some level of rigor. So I feel like the discussion is growing. I don't know if the evidence is there yet to support that the rigor is necessarily improved yet, but clearly we're all trying to make that effort. <laughs> Thanks for a nice talk. Well, thank you. Yep. Yeah, thank you. If, if there's any other questions, you guys can ask them now. I have to get off to get on. I know. I'm sorry I was late, y'all. It was my computer was being uncooperative. <laughs> but this was very helpful. And it, and I think it's it will, it's nice that this will be um, archived too, so people can go look at this. You know, it's the kind of thing to write, but right in the throes of writing a grant, you'll, it'll be nice to go back and review some of this as True. well. Well, I appreciate that. And again, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to email me as well. Because again, I know we kind of ended up short on time because of my computer being argumentative with Zoom. Well, thank you, Dr. Wolf, for taking the time to talk with us today. Um, we will be sending a follow-up email to you all in the coming days with a link to access a recording of this talk in case you would like to listen to it again or share it with anyone. And then, um, I am going to also launch a poll. So if you have time to go ahead and do the poll, um, it is anonymous and um, it will appear on your screen now. So if you have time to stick around for that poll, please do so. And thank you all for attending this talk and have a wonderful day and a wonderful weekend. And thank you, Sam, for organizing on short notice so that council could go off and enjoy her wedding. <laughs> I'm sure she's somewhere beautiful and I'm a little jealous, but.